Okay. Well, let me also start by saying thank you very much uh, to the organizers and for having me. This is really exciting. I haven't seen some of you in about a decade, so this is really, really cool. Um, such a fantastic group of people. Um, I'm going to talk about something that I didn't do with Mark, uh, but I will start with uh, a couple slides that emphasize what we worked on with Mark. And uh, obviously, there's a polar bear swimming, uh, supposed to represent the impacts of climate change, which is what I was very interested on during my PhD, uh, how they will fare, you know, 50, 100 years from now when the ice is all gone. And I very distinctly remember this moment early, but this started 2003, this must have been 2004 or something, where I was very proud of all the equations that I learned in class and I wanted to apply them to polar bears. And I was getting incredibly frustrated that that wasn't working the way I wanted it. And I didn't realize it at the time, or at least I didn't articulate it as well, but I was running into one of the most fundamental problems of global change ecology. Essentially, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is how I highlight, uh, Oops. Uh, this is the Arctic sea ice extent as measured by the red line, and then you have a whole bunch of, uh, of, of model projections. And the point to highlight here is we're somewhere here, but I'm interested in what the ecosystem will look like under this scenario, and I can't really empirically measure that until things have happened, and that is, of course, too late for planning purposes. So um, that was a point when Mark essentially set me down and gave me a long story about a hammer and a nail. Um, how I'm looking at the whole problem the wrong way. I don't know if Mark remembers that, but that was one of my moments that really stuck with me throughout my career. And now I tend to annoy my students with that same talk. Um, essentially, we needed to look at the problem differently. When you think of population viability analysis, typically what they're trying to do is take estimates of reproduction and survival and then predict abundance from that. Once you do the math, it's straightforward. But we don't have estimates for birth and death under these future conditions. So the question became whether we could uh, estimate these parameters based on some other mechanistic considerations. So build, build up one step below to get to these population viability analysis. And that turned out to be very fruitful, that line of thinking. We published a whole bunch of papers that were really exciting with Mark. And this is the last thing I say about polar bears. I just want to assure you that the project is alive and well and ongoing. And that to this point, 10 years later, we still have not done what I promised I would do for my PhD <laughs> um, to develop, develop a full dynamic energy budget model for polar bears. We currently have a postdoc on it who will finish two years from now. So we'll see where we're then. Um, but what I do want to talk about to you, to, uh, uh, to you today is about similar approaches, but now to understand how uh, disease uh, will be altered under a change in climate. And I'm not going to give you a whole background. There's plenty of case studies, plenty of examples. I think we're all familiar with them. But again, when we're trying to predict what will happen in the future, we're running into the same problem. You can't empirically measure what hasn't happened yet. There's a lot of no, no analog conditions. And on top of that, I don't have data for literally more than 99.9% .9 of all species. And yet things are changing, so I would want to make some statement about how things would be changing. And then if I look at the theoretical framework, I'm, I'm also encountering a whole bunch of challenges. There's this wonderful book by uh, Bob May and uh, Roy Anderson, 600 pages of every imaginal host parasite model that you can think of, and based the basis for what we do today in disease ecology. Except all of those models were developed for stable environment. Not a single one, as far as I know, considers changes. Um, existing models were often overly simplistic. And I'm looking back sort of 20 years now in the early 2000s when people first started thinking about climate change and disease. We use things like degree day models, where you essentially scale the development of your critter with temperature in a linear way. And so you're saying, well, the, the warmer it is, the faster they will develop. And then that leads to these really uh, overly simplistic conclusions. I don't know if you've heard this before, but it is in the literature many, many times. A warmer world is a, whoops, a warmer world is a thicker world. Coming from simplified arguments like this, where you're basically saying, well, the season's gonna extend, that helps for more parasite generations within a season, and they're developing faster, so you're getting even more parasite generations within a season. Therefore, everything's gonna be thicker. Um, it's a wonderful paper, but unfortunately, it's very wrong in this particular regard. Uh, and when I went into my postdoc, we sort of started thinking along the same lines as I've done for the polar bears. Like, well, 
you're essentially, when you're saying these degree day models, you're basically saying development is the limiting factor and that's all that matters. Can we actually build a more comprehensive model where we would uh, represent all the temperature sensitivities that are going on in such a system? So you have, you know, your host sitting on top here, you have some adult parasites in there, they produce eggs. These eggs become free living larvae that are uninfective to the host. They grow up, are infective larvae, and then through some sort of encounter rate process, they go end up in the host again. And if you think of it this way, you have the development step here, which does get faster as it gets warmer, at least up to some limit. But you also have mortalities here that are temperature sensitive. You have this transmission process, which may depend on movement and is therefore temperature sensitive. And what we suggested is, well, for starters, let's forget about all these degree day models. Let's represent the entire dynamics as far, as far as we understand them in what we call life cycle based host parasite models, because we're representing the life cycle of the parasite in every step and the temperature sensitivities that come along with it. Um, once you do that, through some basic math, you get uh, the basic reproductive ratio, you get a whole bunch of other disease metrics, all of them as a function of temperature, if you put those temperature sensitivities into these various processes. And then, you know, you add them up and they integrate, and this is my example, are not for a particular system. The question, of course, is maybe just postponed, because if you look at something like malaria, we have enough data to parameterize all these thermal performance curves to, and then calculate R0 from that. There's tons of studies that allow you to do that. But in most cases, those famous 99%, uh, you don't have that. You have next to no data in most cases or no data in most cases. Um, there has been something around in ecology called the metabolic theory of ecology for about a couple decades now formalized and many more decades if you look at the precursors that essentially allows you to make some statements about what these temperature sensitivities would be like based on metabolic principles. And again, without going into too much detail, what you're essentially finding is um, what's called the boltzmann arrhenius curve here in the middle. It's an exponentially increasing function for rates such as development or rates such as uh, survival and then when it gets too cold and too warm these uh things drop to zero and this function that i plotted up here is called the sharp school field function it has really three key parameters um that activation energy that that determines the steepness of this curve and how temperature sensitive really things really are and then the inactivation energies at both ends that basically tell you how things, how quickly things drop to zero when it gets too warm or too cold. And again, you put stuff together. Um, the thing is, this is a nice idea. Whether or not it really works in a way that we can maybe come up with a parasite forecast, just like a weather forecast, we do need to test these ideas in multiple levels. And so I want to use this talk to show you quickly two proof of concept case studies that do show you that this works to some degree. And then I want to show you some searches for generalizations that we've done and leave it at that. Uh, so for starters, uh, proof of concept, um, we looked at disease emergence in an experimental lab um, microcosm. And we looked at range changes under warming as the Arctic warms, how the parasites migrate northwards with that warming. And uh, some of you uh, will recognize that guy on the top right here. Um, he was my first office mate in Mark Lewis's lab. He was the guy that I met first when I, when I learned about math biology. And as things come full circle, once I started at the University of Toronto, Marty was already there and they had this really cool system going on, um, specifically designed uh, to look at the effects of warming with his uh, PhD student, Devin Kirk. And so the system is quickly explained. You have Daphnia swimming in the water. You have this parasite that gets filtered in through feeding processes. They reproduce internally in the Daphnia, and then they're uh, released into the water column again to infect other Daphnia. Now, there's also, again, a lot of data into this, but essentially once we uh, fit, fitted some models and we could show that these, these MTE functions would represent all of the different steps very nicely, whether it's parasite growth or host infection or Daphnia aging, it all kind of works. So to get to our step, uh, to our goal of 
disease prediction, uh, there were well, the usual steps. You develop your mechanistic models. You take these MTE functions that I showed you to put in there. Um, then you predict what's going to happen for uh, once you warm a system. And then, of course, it's an experimental system, so you can test all these things. I'm not going to show you all the equations because I really don't want to delve into details. I want to get through the whole framework. But basically, you know, we're tracking susceptible Daphnia, infected Daphnia, dead and infective ones, and then the parasite spores in the environment. And then you have all your usual mechanistic suspects in there from which you can calculate your R0. Um, comprised as usual uh, of, of the different steps along the parasite's life, whatever happens within the host, whatever happens at disease transmission, and each of these, or most of these, have temperature associated with them, which is parameterized by the MTE functions. Once you do that, you come up with a figure something like this that tells you what your R0 would be. And remember, R0 equal 1 is the threshold. Uh, on the two axes, you have temperature and host density. And you can see the prediction is, we actually start our experiments here at 10 degrees. If, it's, uh, if we go into 12 degrees or warmer, there should be a disease emergence. So do we see that in real life? Well, um, Marty can tell us how many hours Dev, uh, Devin spent in the lab. It's certainly on the order of years and not, not, not insignificant. Um, there's a lot of work that went into this. Basically, raising four populations of Daphnia at 10 degrees constant, and then four populations that you consistently warm every 15 days until you cross that threshold. And as expected, and, and maybe even more precise than we expected, and granted there's some uncertainty here, but essentially the 10 degrees stayed at a constant low level prevalence, which is just um, the disease that we were introducing at various time steps to keep things going. Whereas in the uh, warming experiment, a disease or an epidemic emerged, and it did so more or less at that threshold that we anticipated based on these physiological relationships. Now, that's in the lab. The question is, does this work in the field? And I'm sure you're familiar with that idea that uh, you know, the world warms, and so you're creating these, these environments further up north that will now become suitable for parasite and or host to get there and to sustain it. So ranges are shifting polewards, and the question is, can we predict that? We have this wonderful system on musk oxen and a lung worm uh, in the Canadian Arctic archipelago, working with Susan Coots out of the University of Calgary and my PhD student, Alex Nasco, whose work this is mostly, I should really say that, I'm just presenting here. Um, it's a parasite that was restricted to the mainland uh, up until 2008, and then it appeared on the island and started spreading northwards. It's got a slightly more complicated life cycle, although it's not too extreme. You again have the adults living in the musk ox, and they produce infective larvae, or actually uninfective for the musk ox larvae. These larvae need to find a snail or a slug. They grow up in that slug. Uh, to infectivity, and then there's two options. It either leaves the slug or it gets ingested with the slug. Muskox graze, they don't discriminate. Whatever is there gets, gets taken up. And so we can use that same approach. We can write down the model. Um, we can write down a whole bunch of equations representing all these dynamics over time. Again, I don't want you to get lost in all the details of it, but I want to note that, again, you have some effects where warming benefits the parasites, such as they develop faster. You have some where it's to their detriment, such as they don't live as long, and then you have some that are more, more complicated, such as the transmission process. You can parameterize all of this, and all of these curves are very simplified now, but essentially they involve data at every level of the system, from what we see in the field to inf infectious, uh, infection experiments in Calgary to parasites raised in the lab, whatever. And uh, once you do that, you calculate your R0 again, you figure out your boundaries, and then you plot them on a map. And it, because we have mathematicians here, I should be careful to say that this is actually the seasonal extension of R0. So we do this via Floquet theory. Big thanks to Amy for pointing us in the right direction. Um, but the, the point is, you know, this white line here determines the threshold where the model says above that there shouldn't be any persistence, below that there should be persistence. Are we capturing things? Yes and no. Um, there's more here that I don't have time for. But what I would want, do want you to notice 
is that it does capture um, the effect on various islands where you have these black dots that the parasite didn't quite get there. You do have some parasites here above that white line, which I personally interpret as not persisting, but being in the dispersal process. Um, but again, that would take quite a bit to go into much more detail here. The second question, though, I want to ask is, you know, these systems are great, but they all have a lot of data. Most don't. So what do I do? How do I get around that? And I asked the question on two levels, uh, one essentially relating to the parameters and the second relating to the structure of the model. So the first thing that we can ask is whether there are among species general generalities in these activation energies that would allow us maybe to predict what the value would be for species that we haven't studied yet. And metabolic theory finds lots of patterns like this in free living species, but it hasn't been done for parasites. So one of my undergraduate uh, senior thesis students, she took it upon herself to collate every thermal performance curve ever published that she could find since 1945. And then we fitted a bunch of Arrhenius and Sharp school field models to this. We get a distribution of these activation energies, i.e. of the temperature sensitivities. And then we can ask, well, do they depend on something? And it turns out, uh, counter to our expectations, they do not actually depend on whether you're a plant parasite or an animal parasite, whether you have a free living, whoops, sorry, whether you're a free living host or whether you're a within the host. Maybe we just don't have enough data for that. But what we did find is that activation energies did depend very strongly on whether a species was terrestrial or aquatic and where it originated from. A cold adapted parasite will have a lower activation energy than a warm adapted parasite. And most importantly, phylogeny was a really strong predictor. In other words, while there are exceptions, if you have studied parasite A, but not B, but B is related to A, it does allow you to make some preliminary statements. So how about the structure of the model? Well, there is a wide variety of parasites. It still continues to baffle me, despite having worked on this for about a decade now all having different types of life cycles and whatnot, but there are commonalities and we can ask whether these commonalities allow us to make some statements. If I understand A, do I understand B? Um, I plot three examples here, which I'm going to keep referring to. Uh, one, well, I, I'll, get, I'll get into detail for it. Let, let them just be placeholders for now. Um, but I do want to point out, sorry. I do want to point out that we distinguish between simple and complex life cycles. Simple life cycles, you have one host. Uh, complex life cycle, you have two hosts, many hosts, intermediate hosts, all sorts of other things involved. And one of the big questions in global change disease ecology is, you know, since we can't predict them all, uh, is there a certain type of parasite that would proliferate more than an other under a warming system? And there are a bunch of arguments. Uh, the earliest that I could find is from 2004 from a paper in Science that argues from a demographic perspective that these guys would be more extinction prone than these guys because you have more hosts. So therefore, the chances that at least one of your hosts goes extinct is larger and then you have a problem. Then we wrote a paper because I like to argue with people in 2013 saying like that's all true, but you're forgetting a whole bunch of stuff. For instance, the behavioral perspective. These snails here, this is an island in, in Yemen uh, where it obviously gets very hot. They go up in the middle uh, of the day on these trees to be cooled from the wind, which cools the parasites as well. The ones with the simple life cycles, they're sitting on the ground and they're baking in the sun. So if you model this out, you'll find the opposite result. And what we've done lately and not quite published yet um, is to take a third perspective to ask, are there, can we classify these life cycles in some other way? And as you can imagine, you have all these positives and negative temperature sensitivities, and they will all interact to determine what or not as a function of temperature looks like, and therefore how a species responds to warming. So I just want to quickly show you the logic behind this. And I want to start with this very, very, very simple life cycle, long warm of dogs. This is environmentally transmitted. You don't have an intermediate host. So essentially, whatever ends up in the environment is immediately infectious to the next dog that comes around. So the only temperature sensitive component of this system is survival. How long are you in the environment before the next dog comes around? 
survival decreases with temperature. So you get a curve like this. Since that is the only temperature dependent component, R0 is going to look like that as well, right? And so you have warm scoot, the scoot is towards the warm temperatures here, which should ring some bells for classical ecologists where a classical result says that these fitness curves are always cold scoot. They're always the other way around. And we're not seeing that here. If I take a slightly more complicated example, um, uh, caribou, uh, again, environmental transmission, you don't have an intermediate host, but you do develop in the environment. So now you have three things that are temperature dependent, the mortality, the development, and the transmission. Um, all of them are, of course, in the R0, where you have the two steps, it's the probability that this uninfective larva makes it to here before dying, and then the probability to make it from here to there before dying. And the result in hindsight is, is in, in my view, is really elegant and really intuitive, and I did not expect this to happen. Um, essentially, you can think about these positive and negative temperature dependencies, and it really becomes down to the balance between the two. Here I compare the one of development minus uh, the one of mortality, and here the one of uptake minus mortality. So I'm comparing all the positives and the negatives. And what you find intuitively if both of the positives are more temperature sensitive than the negative one, you end up with an increasing R0. If both of them are less temperature sensitive, you end up with a decreasing R0. And in between, you get these peaks. Um, what's really cool is that uh, first proof that I've done in about 10 years, this does generalize to every system via what we call a balanced equation, where again, you have end up with more terms, but you just add them up and subtract them from one another. And it tells you whether which shape your R0 will be. Cold scoot, warm scoot, something in between. Um, lots of interesting applications arise from this that I don't have time for, but I do want to tell you why this actually matters, the shape of R0. And this goes back to, again, the first paper where we introduced this approach, where in a discussion paragraph, I was teaches you that even in a discussion paragraph, you should really think about what you're writing. Um, we were making this argument that if you, if you think about an environment that we just raise the temperature and so you have, I think I made plus five degree for the dashed dash line compared to the solid ones. And then you look at your um, warm scoot, cold scoot, and symmetric curves and plot them out under both conditions. And what you find is that uh, the warm scoot curve are not incre increases over a very small area and decreases over the rest of the area. So I think of it spatially. And then the opposite, of course, in the cold scoot scenario. So from that, I was arguing that this leads more looking into, but the cold scoot curve appears to benefit the parasites more than the warm scoot ones. And then we had this wonderful, wonderful uh, conference at the Banff International Research Station on the impacts of biological invasions and population distributions. And uh, Christina and Amy and I, we actually started on various detours before we ended up working on this, but we basically noticed that if we simulate this out, if we actually write down a model that has the dispersal process in there, and granted this is not for parasites, but for free living species, because like I said, detours and we needed to simplify, but you do find the opposite result. So simulating you know, population abundance in space and time, and you do it for three different curves, and you get these traveling waves. And at the end of the day, you're adding up whether the parasites change their range, how far they were lagging behind the edge of their niche, and whether they change their abundance, not parasites, free living species. And you find exactly the opposite result of what I just told you, because essentially when you have these warm scoot curves, they put the bulk of the, 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 the where the high R0 is at the edge where the range expansion is actually happening. So it results in the largest potential of, uh, for these range expansions. Um, this is where we are at about right now. And so I just want to briefly mention this before I wrap up. Um, we're currently trying to build a framework for climate change and land use change and host parasite dynamics and how it all works out. So, Obviously, as a next step, take this book and put change in there and see what happens. I was really intrigued by a lot of the movement talks here because one of the things I'm thinking about is land use change and host parasite dynamics. And again, 
thinking about it from the perspective that we don't have data for most things. So can we find ways to generalize as well as use that same framework in a tactical way for, for more um, specific species? We started some work, again, we, circles coming full close. Uh, Stephanie Peacock was a PhD student of Marx and then became a postdoc with me. And then we worked on this wonderful she has a series of paper thinking about these movement dynamics. Uh, test and improve this, this whole models in a bunch of systems from Toronto to Costa Rica to Yukon, and uh, ultimately put it into some sort of forecasting framework. Uh, shamelessly, I'm going to make one pitch for me here. I am looking for mathy students to help me do this, and since you all have mathy students, or are maybe mathy students, if you know someone, talk to me. Um, other than that, uh, this is the only math bio cake that I found on the internet. I googled math bio <laughs> cake, and this is, they're in New Orleans, so Mark, if we, that's where we do the next one, we can organize those cakes <laughs> along with it. Um, thank you very much for having me, and happy birthday, Mark. <laughs>